I call the member for Canberra. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it was day one as the newly minted member for Canberra. I just picked up the keys from my electorate office and I was opening it up for the very first time. I was on my own because none of my team had started yet. And as I opened the door, I heard the phone ringing. At the end of the line was a very distressed woman, a single mother, living with her three daughters in her mum's two-bedroom home, sleeping on the couch, doing it tough, desperate for a home. I got Leah home, and she is just one of the many Canberrans my team and I have helped to secure that most fundamental of needs, yeah. safe shelter. And it's those days, Speaker, those days that are the very best days of this job. Because as another single mother said to me, my whole life turned around once I got a house. Right. Speaker, it's a reminder that there is no greater office in this chamber than that of local member. When I spoke for the first time in this chamber, I said, I admire anyone who takes up the challenge of politics and who honestly tries to improve the lives of his or her people, no matter what political lights they follow. In the end, it's about improving people's lives. And at its best, politics is about building a better community and a better nation. But, Speaker, politics is a contest of ideas. And there is a reason why I am Labor. I come from a working class matriarchy of single mothers just like Lee. My great grandmother was a domestic. She brought up 13 children on her own in a house with dirt floors and paper walls. She spent her life bent over a copper, cleaning the clothes of the wealthy, of the wealthy and she left school when she was just 11. My grandmother worked three cleaning jobs. She brought up seven children on her own in a housing commission home. She spent her life with an abiding fear that the state would take her children away because she was poor. And she left school at just 13. My mother was dragged kicking and screaming from school at 15. I'm not looking at you, Mum. She brought up my sisters and me on her own when my father left us when I was 11 with $30 in the bank. Those early years after he left were really tough. We ate out every second night at relatives and friends. There were no school camps, and my desk was borrowed from my school, my public school. Each and every day, Mum lived with, the, with, lived with the fear that the cycle of poverty and disadvantage would continue for yet another generation. But her world and mine changed forever because of labour. I got a quirky but quality public education and became the first woman in my family to go to university. Yeah. university. I got to go to university thanks to the Labor government, the Whitlam Labor government, who ensured my tertiary education was free. And thanks to Gough and with the support of friends and family and my mother's determination and tenacity, my sisters and I broke free of that cycle of disadvantage. We are living proof of the transformative powers of education. My middle sister, Meg, is Australia's first female master of wine and an internationally renowned winemaker. My baby sister, Amy, is an internationally acclaimed neurologist specialising in stroke and dementia. And I am the enormously proud member for Canberra and a shadow assistant minister. Unlike our female forebears, Meg and Amy and I have had choice and opportunity. Unlike the long line of sisters stretching back through history, we are empowered. Labor gave us education. Labor gave us universal health care. Labor gave us fertility control. And that has given us financial independence that has allowed us to lead bold and fearless lives. I want that for every Australian. I want that for every Canberran. I want every Australian, I want every Canberran to have the opportunity that we have enjoyed even though we didn't come from wealth or privilege. Our opportunities came from the social policies of the 1970s and the 1980s. Our opportunities came from Labor. Now, Speaker, I sought a career in politics after careers in public service and small business for many reasons. To serve and represent my community, to fight for my beloved Canberra, particularly after being one of the thousands of public servants who lost their job in the Howard government cuts of 1996, to influence and shape public policy. Now, as I leave this place, I like to think I've achieved some of that, 
despite two of my three terms being in opposition. And it's not a both spe speaker, but it is the recognition of a great gift. I know that few get the opportunity I have had to serve, and I will be forever grateful that ACT Labor, many of whom are here today, chose me to do, the, chose me to do that on your behalf. Because leadership is not about the power of one speaker, it's about one person, how one person can harness the power of many, how one person can amplify the hopes of many in solidarity with others. I serve because I truly, I deeply love my community. And it's one of the continuing follies of this place that MPs think they can score cheap political points by claiming Canberra isn't part of the nation. Because, Speaker, without Canberra, there would be no Australia. To borrow the words of Sir Henry Parks, the crimson thread of kinship runs through us all, and those threads are drawn together here in this city. If I've succeeded here, it's because I've helped Canberrans stand up and fight for everything that makes this city great, and the people who live and work in this city, particularly our proud servants of democracy who make this nation great. Now, the Prime Minister likes to talk about the Canberra bu bubble, and I want to tell you, Deputy Sp sorry, Speaker, what uh, that bubble actually looks like. There in that bubble are public servants who protect our national interests, who make sure our cities and towns are safe, who make sure our food is clean, who help the sick, who help the aged, the, who help the disadvantaged, who help the disabled. There in that bubble, Speaker, is uh, people, public servants, who keep our history alive, our story alive. And the husband and daughter of one of the finest public servants that I've ever worked with, my dear friend Liz O'Neill, are here today. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming, Liz and, uh, Wayne and Lucinda. Liz died in the line of duty in the Garuda crash in Jogjakarta in 2007, when Lucinda was just six months old. And it's just wonderful that you're here today, that you've taken the day of school, your first year at King Koppel, uh, to be with me to hear this valedictory speech. And we all miss your mum very, very much. Um, we think about her each and every day. So thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Lucinda, for coming. <laughs> Speaker, public service is a noble calling and should be lauded and not derided. And I've been proud to take up the fight for public servants and everyone else in my community. It's one of the favourite parts of my job. Having the platform to bang on about Canberra, having the platform to advocate for Canberra, having the platform to celebrate and share the achievements of my community, to sing the praises of local and school legends, inspirational volunteers, inspirational leaders, quiet achievers. Speaker, as you know, I am not the queen of 90-second statements for nothing. <laughs> now, I've been proud to take up the fight against cuts to the public service and our national institutions, against cuts to our public and Catholic schools, against next to zero federal investment in infrastructure in our national capital in the last six years, against injustice. Injustice, like that experienced uh, by Lachlan. Lachlan, whose NDIS plan slashed his core supports so vital services were taken from a child, this child, whose uncontrollable seizures led him to having one third of his brain removed when he was just 12 months old. Speaker, I fought against the hate that saw the Canberra Islamic Centre vandalised and I helped summon the better angels of this town for the clean-up. Mm -hmm. And I've summoned those better angels so many times to support domestic violence services, to support rape crisis, uh, crisis services, to support food bank and sanitary product and back to school drives. I fought against the sexism that debases women and girls and robs them of opportunity. And I fought against indifference and I fought <coughs> against ignorance. Like the wall of silence experienced by up to one million Australian um, women suffering from endometriosis, and I want to thank the endo warriors and the endo activists and the members for Forest and the members for Boothby and the Minister for Health and the Shadow Minister for the work that we've done together on ending the silence on endometriosis. Yeah. We have made a difference on endo. We have made a difference. It is palpable. Finally, these women are being heard. So thank you, sisters, for being part of that fight. 
I also want to thank the member for Higgins and Senator Hanson Young, Ovarian Cancer Australia, Sabra Lane, Eliza Borello, and Jane Norman for the work that we've done together on this deadliest of women's cancers. Thank you so much. Speaker, when I was elected in 2010, I came to Parliament with a very long list of things to do to improve organ and tissue donations rates in Australia. Uh, to empower girls and women to be confident, to believe in themselves, to have the courage of their convictions. I've done this empowerment with women with gusto and it has been one of the highlights of my time here. I've mentored hundreds of girls and women, fought hard for housing for single mothers and older women and repeatedly underscored the fact, and I'll repeat it again, sisters, a man is not a financial plan. Being the beneficiary of the charity of others in my seminal years, I was also keen to encourage giving and altruism, but with dignity and respect. The Selvos gave that to my grandmother during hard times, so much of the work I've done in Canberra has been done quietly, it's been done without fanfare, it's been done without media, and like so many in this chamber. Speaker, after running my own micro-business for 10 years before coming into politics, I also wanted to improve the understanding among decision makers and government agencies about the lived experience of a small business owner. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this front, particularly on the basics, like government agencies actually paying the bills on time and also government agencies giving access to smaller micro-businesses to government work. Just buy one. That's all I ask. Before small business, I served Australia as a diplomat and I worked with brilliant men and women, some of them are here today, and learned that if we are to flourish as, uh, as a nation, we have to be outward looking and generous. In an interconnected and uncertain world, we cannot be indifferent to what happens beyond our borders. A peaceful, prosperous Australian future hangs on a peaceful and prosperous future for our region and our world, and that will not happen by accident. It will be built on diplomacy, it will be built on the rule of law, it will be built on norms and it will be built on defence. Because diplomacy demands a strong and modern defence force. Because sometimes we have to defend our freedom and that of our friends. And we have to have an understanding, Speaker, of what it is that we are prepared to fight for, what it is that we cherish. The values on which we will never compromise. Yes, it is an uncertain age but it provides us with an opportunity to have a conversation about how we will operate and engage in the national interest. It's an opportunity to articulate the principles that will operate inside our borders and how they will translate to our approach beyond them. It's an opportunity to acknowledge that we are indeed a middle power, but a middle power that is confident in asserting how we will engage at home and abroad and how we think others should engage in Australia and abroad. It's an opportunity to say, this is who we are. This is what will guide us. This is what we will discuss. And these are the no-go zones. Now, in the time I've been here, I've also seen the rise of a new threat. Our interconnected world has brought great wonders, but it's also brought adversaries into our offices and our homes. We need to be doing much, much more on every front on cyber security. To be quite frank, I am alarmed about the complacency on this issue in some circles. The complacency around skills, around standards, about em around empowerment, about government agency and critical infrastructure, cyber resilience, about innovation, about research, industry cooperation, and the fact that only 11 per cent of the workforce are women in the cyber industry. We have got to grip this up, Australia. We are falling behind the rest of the world, and the urgency on cyber security is now. Speaker, in an age that is more connected than ever, in an era where that connectedness is meant to enhance democracy, Australians now seem to be more disengaged and disillusioned, and through that disenfranchised. We, in this place, in the media, in the community, have been the first to call for behavioural and cultural change in our schools, in the corporate world, in our boardrooms, in our cultural, sporting, academic and religious institutions, in the public service and in the ADF. Yet, we are particularly quiet, particularly coy, when it comes to the need for behavioural and cultural change here, in this place. Now, we all know Parliament is a contest of ideas, and that contest, rightly, should be rigorous and robust. But that contest should not be personal, and it does not need to be a blood sport. So please, in my final days, please can we have more policy and less posturing in Parliament? Speaker, 
Over the course of my three terms, I've lost too many friends and loved ones. Vale again to Brendan Morrison, Kurt Steele, Garth Pilkington, Liz Dawson, Jason Hinder, Yarm Menzies, Amanda Cavill, Michael Byrne, Chris Grady, Mary Yulman, Ian Yulman and my father, Graham Brotman. Now I know the danger of thanking people means that someone gets left out, so I seek forgiveness in advance for the fact that this list that, that follows will be too long for some and too short for others. Thank you to the member for Fowler and the member for Lawler for being model whips, supporters and shoulders. Thank you to Stephen Conroy and the member for Corio for giving me the licence and freedom to develop policies in the defence and cyber security portfolios and I have loved every single minute of it. And to David Feeney and the member for Ida Monero for your advice and assistance. As a junior front bencher, I have been truly, truly blessed to work with people like you, so thank you so much. Thank you to the many members of the ADF that I've met on ships and bases here and overseas. We are also blessed as a nation to have a highly trained and committed ADF and Defence Department, and it's been a privilege to meet and work with you. Thank you to the members for Cunningham, Greenway, Parramatta, Newcastle, Richmond, Lingiari, Wakefield, Kingston, Melbourne Ports, Blair, Gippsland, Wannan, Tangney, to my colleague here, uh, Senators Pratt, Kitching, Reynolds, Mackenzie and Dean Smith and Deb Biggs for your friendship. Thank you to Michael Forshaw, Simon Crean, Martin Ferguson and Gary Gray for your mentoring in my first term. Thank you to Gail Morgan, Narell Lachetti, Simon Tatz, Alison Byrne and Paul Scully for getting me here, and the many members of my team, and hi to Madeleine Firth and um, Alicia uh, Turner, who are in Scotland, watching from Scotland, for keeping me here and helping me serve the people of Canberra so well. Thank you to my current team, Vic, Drew, Steph, Netta and Martin. Canberra is the largest electorate by population in this country and you have given your all to provide the highest level of service in a busy high street office and to work with me on policies. Particular thanks to Eva Cawthorne, my first Chief of Staff, who helped me set up my office from scratch, which was a very steep learning curve for both of us. A steep learning curve not helped by both of us being in the throes of the hot flushes, night sweats, endless periods, <laughs> sleeplessness, anxiety, mood swings and depression that is the wonderful hormonal ride of perimenopause. <laughs> and this is something else we should be talking about, Australia. <laughs> Thank you to Norfolk Islanders, Mike King, Mel Ward, Sue Menzies and the Banyan Park Girls for your wisdom, guidance and friendship on the journey of reform. Thank you to Canberra's multicultural community, particularly Sandy Mitra, Diana, Diana Abdul Rahman, Na Natalie Mohini and Chin Wong. Thank you to Aspies, Peter Jennings, Fergus Hanson, Daniel Cave, Lisa Charland, Anthony Bergen and Stephen Lucy for your sage advice for being my brain's trust. Thank you to the Canberrans who have tirelessly served on my many grants panels, particularly Steve Rowan Jones, Anthony Corder, and Louise Bilston, who've been there with me from the start. Thank you, Diana. Where are you, Diana? Thank you to Diana Atkinson, who's kept our house in order for more than 20 years. <laughs> you always give above and beyond, most recently when it became the house of horrors and was filled with hundreds of blowflies after a rat died in our roof when we were away at the coast over summer. Thank you, Diana. I think a round of applause for Diana for that effort. Thank you to my patient, patient girlfriends who've always been there for me, even though I haven't always been there to, for you. Special thanks to my best mate, Virginia Stanhope. Thank you to our deputy leader for your tireless commitment to advancing the cause of women. Thank you to the leader of the opposition for your friendship and support, particularly at the beginning of this term. There is daylight between my first term and the last two terms. You have led a truly united team and you've encouraged us all to be bold in our thinking and our ideas to advance our great Labor tradition, so thank you. Thank you to my wonderful sisters who unfortunately can't be here today. Meg's in the middle of vintage and Amy is in the middle of clinic. Neither of them wanted me to go into politics, but they've given me boundless loyalty and merciless honesty, <laughs> which they've been giving me all their lives. Thank you to my beautiful nieces and nephews and godchildren, to my mum, a champion campaigner who, contrary to popular belief, which was not helped by my media release, is actually alive and well. She's up there. <laughs> Sorry, Mum, for frightening all your friends and your current affairs. Cryptic crossword, move it or lose it, and Zumba classmates with the unintentional suggestion that you were dying. 
Thank you for teaching Meg, Amy and me to be strong and confident feminists, to be proud of our womanhood. Thank you for teaching us the importance of education, fertility, control, financial independence, for teaching us to treat everyone with respect and dignity. Thank you to my beautiful husband, Chris Yulman. I'm not going to lose it here. I know our relationship has been an endless source of fascination for so many in the past years, which we have both found rather curious. But you are the love of my life. And my love only grows stronger for you each and every day. Thank you so much for the, your support, which has allowed me to give to the people of Canberra my heart and my soul for three terms. Speaker, I have chosen to leave my political career at this point because I now want to give my heart and soul to my family and friends. Mum turning 80 this year and the loss of too many close friends too young has made me realise that life is short and life is precious. When you're saying goodbye over the phone to a friend in his 50s who has just two weeks to live, or you're saying goodbye to a friend in his 60s who has hours to live, which we did over the summer break, you do really focus on what's important in life. And for me, that is my husband, my family, my friends and my godchildren. It's now time to change down a few gears. So I'm closing this chapter of my career and looking forward to the next one, knowing I will always serve my community, just not at the same pace. Representing the people of Canberra has been an enormous honour and privilege and brought me great pride and joy. And I want to thank you, Canberra, for putting your faith in me for three terms. Above all, I want to thank my Labor family for your support and now allowing me to be part of, play a small role, admittedly, but to play a small role in our great Labor story. I'm not a blind partisan and have many friends of all political dispositions, but I am Labor to my bootstraps. In 1983, I handed out my first How to Votes in the election that saw the Hawke Labor government sweep to power. 36 years on, I'm looking forward to handing out How to Votes for a Labor, shortened Labor government. To those who now take up Labor's fight for Bean and Canberra and to Senator Dave Smith and Alicia Payne, I am with you. Because we are in the battle of ideas and I believe it's vitally important that we win. When we win, our prosperity is shared. Our children get the chance of a world-class education. Australia gets a country that supports the weak, a nation that uses its wealth to help the poor. When we win, individuals are encouraged to excel, but never at the expense of the common good. Workers get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. We fight for jobs. We fight for the environment. When we win, our nation is outward looking and engaged with our allies and the forums of the world. We demand from each the best they can give and offer to each the chance to be the best they can be. A shortened Labor government will change Canberra and it will change the nation for the better, offering equality, choice and hope to all, no matter what their postcode, no matter what their background, no matter how much their parents earn opportunity for people like Meg and Amy and me to realise their potential, to contribute to their community and to lead bold and fearless lives. I thank the House.
Yeah, I'll just... Yeah, um, I acknowledge the member for Canberra. The hug took time perfectly and I've ended at the perfect time. So the debate is interrupted in accordance with standing order 43. The debate may be resumed at a later hour.